wish you all a happy Memorial Day weekend and glad that you have come. It looks like we have a good attendance. We love the holiday summer weekends because we get a lot of people that come to the lake. And uh, it's good to see you, even though we only see you like a couple of times a year. I'm glad that you are here with us. I also appreciate songs that are uh, to do with our subject. As we're talking, as you can see on the screen there, we're going to talk about singing today. And so if you would get out your Bible, we will be looking at some passages. The first one will be in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And then there's also some notes in the bulletin. So if you pull that out, you'll be able to uh, follow along and that will give you the scriptures. I'm hoping to give you something today between this morning's message and the one at six, something that you could hand to another person who has questions about this subject of why do we just sing? How come we don't use musical instruments? I try to preach on this about every three years because it's a very important subject and it's something we get a lot of questions about and we get a lot of new people every three years or so. Uh, it's been over six years and so I, I uh, haven't talked much about this but I do want to talk a little bit today about just why we look so different. If you do a Google search of worship, this is the type of pictures that you see. This is what people think of when they think about worship. And so uh, it is, it's very different. And in preparing a message like this, I'm always thinking about those who don't agree with me and my, my conviction about singing a cappella and how important that is. And so if you're one of those persons who disagrees, I, I'm grateful for you listening. Thank you for doing that. I think it's important we hear each other and, and uh, be able to talk about these things. I also want to say that in the time allotted to me, I'm certainly not going to answer all the questions about this subject. And so feel free to contact me. Uh, you can reach us through the website or if you're, if you're here, my, uh, my phone number and my email address are right there on the front of the bulletin. At the bottom of the Curtis's Corner is my email address. And so feel free to reach out to me. We are not the only ones that sing a cappella. There are other religious groups out there. Uh, here's a few that I was able to find. The Appalachian United Baptist Church does not use instruments. Primitive Baptists don't use them. The Free Church of Scotland, the Scottish Free Presbyterian Church, the Anglican Church, the Russian Orthodox Church, the Amish and the Mennonite, and the Greek Orthodox. Now this is around the world, by the way. We, we think about uh, denominations, we don't think about the United States, and there are a couple of hundred different denominations of Christianity in the United States. But do you realize in the United States we only make up 4.5% of the world's population? Did you know that? We're not as big as we think we are, and there's a lot of denominations overseas, and if you look at that list, a lot of these are overseas. Uh, the Greek Orthodox, which is a very old, and, and all they do is they, they study from the Greek, and so obviously they're going to know what the word means, and they don't use instruments. The only other denomination here in Shakota that does not use them is the Mennonite Church here in town. And so we are, are not the only ones, but we are certainly one of the very few. And a lot of people notice when they come for the first time that we don't have a piano or an organ and we don't have the instruments, but they're hesitant to ask. They, they just don't bring it up. And if they did ask, a lot of our members wouldn't honestly know how to answer the question. So I'm hoping to change some of that today. I'm hoping to uh, educate and to uh, give you some tools, at least some things to, to think about. How long has it been that we've been told that if we would add instruments, we could draw more people in? Uh, we've been listening to that for, for decades, haven't we? Uh, we have been told that because we don't have them, it makes us look uh, antiquated, looks like we're not up with the times. Uh, it makes us look like we're out of touch with society because we don't use musical instruments. Uh, we get asked a lot of times, why do we take the instruments out? And my reply to that, and what I aim to show you today, is we did not take them out. Others have added them in. 
And so the, the main point is this first point is that the New Testament church did not use instruments in worship from the beginning. And that is primarily what I'm going to be talking about this morning is the New Testament church. So there's lots of ways to approach this. Uh, one of the things that I want to start with is I want to start with the teachings of the patriarchal fathers or the writings. The patriarchal fathers are... Christians from the first, second, and third century primarily, who were not inspired by God in what they wrote, but they wrote about their Christianity. And so the things I'm going to share with you should never be given the weight of Scripture. They're not uh, graphe, they're not inspired writing, but it is very helpful just to see how early Christians talked about worship and how they talked specifically about this subject. I'm just going to give you three. The first one is St. Clement of Alexandria. He uh, wrote about 190 A.D. And here's what he had to say. Leave the pipe to the shepherd. The flute to the men who are in fear of gods, like pagan gods, and intent on their idol worshiping. Such musical instruments must be excluded from our wingless feast. For they are more suited for beast and for the class of men that is least capable of reason. But as for us, we make use of one instrument alone, only the word of peace, by whom we a homage to God, no longer with ancient harp or trumpet or drum or flute, which those trained for war employ. And so he's saying that we don't, in our worship services, we don't use instruments. That's for the, the pagans. And, and of course, in, in pagan times, uh, the, the, those who worship pagan gods, they had instruments. And uh, it was more of a, uh, a party than uh, what we would consider a worship service. And so they said, he said, we don't do that. And it, he says also the instruments, they're used for war. They're not used for peace, the, the peaceful setting that we are in when we are worshiping God. Here's another one. This, this bro is named Tertullian, 2nd century AD. He says, equally, they are both in the church of God, between the two echo psalms and hymns, and they mutually challenge each other, which shall sing better to the Lord. When you read a lot of this stuff, you get the impression that, uh, well, when uh, a lot of the early churches, they didn't sit in rows like this, they were to the sides. And you had rows over here, and you had rows over there, and usually the women sat on one side and the men sat on the other. And they would sing back and forth to each other. But they would sing, they did not use musical instruments. Here's Eusebius. He says, of old, at the time, those of the circumcision, now that's the Jews, right? He's talking about the Jewish people. Those of the circumcision were worshiping with symbols and types. It was not inappropriate to send up hymns to God with the psaltery and the cithara. Those are musical instruments. And to do this on the Sabbath days. That's when the Jews met, was on Saturday, on the Sabbath day. We render our hymn with a living psaltery and a living cithara with spiritual songs. The unison voices of Christians would be more acceptable to God than any musical instrument. Accordingly, in all the churches of God, united in soul and attitude with one mind and in agreement of faith, the piety we send up a unison melody in the words of the Psalms. So there's just three examples, and of course I can share with you many more, but when we research the literature of what was written 1st, 2nd, and 3rd century by Christians, they, they all say the same thing. We don't use instruments. And they didn't for a long time. I'm actually going to show you uh, how long it was before they brought in instruments. I'll, I'll share that with you here in a moment. Now I want to make this point. Number two, instruments were around. It's not like they hadn't been invented yet. They were around in the New Testament times. They're even mentioned here in 1st Corinthians chapter 14. And look at verse 6 through 8. It says, but now, brethren, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what will I profit you unless I speak to you either by way of revelation or knowledge or of the prophecy or of teaching, yet even lifeless things, either flute or harp, in producing a sound, if they do not produce a distinction in the tones, how will it be known what is played on the flute or the harp? 
For if the bugle produces an indistinct sound, who will prepare himself for battle? So there's the mention of musical instruments. Like I said, they're along around way, way before the time of the New Testament. But they were not used in Christian worship. Point number three, singing on the other hand was as much a part of worship as was praying, preaching, giving, taking the supper. Uh, all Christian worship services involved the act of singing. That was the popular thing to do. So I want to support this. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about my history, though. I did not grow up in the Church of Christ. I actually grew up in a denomination where we played and sang. I, I wrote a, a pamphlet called, I Used to Play the Banjo in Church. And I wrote that because I used to play the banjo in church, believe it or not. That was church to me. And so the first time I came to Church of Christ, it was very odd. I didn't really understand it. Uh, I was taught some things. And, I, and even after I went into the ministry, I, I could give a pretty good argument as to why I believe that we should sing a cappella. But about 13 years ago, I believe it was, I was preaching in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and I was not satisfied with the amount of research that I had done on the subject. And I thought, I really need to, if I'm going to preach this, if I'm going to teach this, I really need to know for sure if we have this one right. But I did not want to go to Church of Christ sources. And so I actually went to the Nazarene Bible College. I got a library card, uh, an amazing library that they have there. I don't know how old the, the Nazarene Bible College is. It's fairly old, but their books are very old, and they have a, a great library there. I went every Tuesday afternoon. I would spend three to five hours studying on the subject, and I did that for eight to ten months. I mean, I really spend a lot of time on that. Uh, you'll be happy to know we're not going to spend that much time this morning on the topic, but I just want you to know I could. We could talk uh, for, I could teach easily uh, a long, long class on this subject. But uh, I, I had to do a lot of research on this. From that, here is the, the premise that I'm going to be working from. For hundreds of years and for nearly a thousand years in Christendom, no denomination used musical instruments in worship to God. Now let me give you the, the background for that. Uh, one old encyclopedia that I looked at was the American Encyclopedia, and here's what he had to say. Pope Vitellian is related to have first introduced organs into some of the churches of Western Europe about 670 A.D. Pay attention to the, the dates here. But the earliest trustworthy account is that of one sent as a present by the Greek emperor Constantine Copernamus to Pepin, the king of the Franks, in 755 B.C. So that's, according to this encyclopedia, that's the earliest reference. Let me give you another one. This is the Chambers Encyclopedia. It says, The organ is said to have been first introduced into mu church music by Pope Vitellian in 666. The dates are a little off from the first one, but close. In 757, a great organ was sent as a present to Pepin, by the Byzantine Emperor Constantine Campanamus and placed in the church at St. Cornel in Compagne. Uh, soon the Charlemagne's, uh, in Charlemagne's time, organs became common. And so let me give you one more. This is the Schaff Herzog uh, Encyclopedia. It says, in the Greek church, the organ never came into use. Now that would be the Greek Orthodox that I was talking about. Never have they never used it. But after the 8th century, it became more and more common in the Latin church. Not, however, without opposition from the side of the monks. These would be the, the Catholic priests, the, the uh, Catholic leaders. The Reform church disc discarded it. Now, I'm not going to be able to have time this morning, but if you'll come back this evening, I want to talk about the Reformation movement. And the ones who started the Reformation had some very strong things to say about that. 
uh, but I won't have time this morning to cover that. So the Reformation Church discarded it, and though the Church of Basel very early introduced it, it was in other places admitted only sparingly, and after long hesitation, and the word hesitation, I, I had to laugh when I read that, after long uh, fights and wars, to be quite honest, everywhere where the instrument was introduced, it caused great strife. Each group that tried to, to bring it in. There's, there's no uh, uh, denying that. Here's the fourth point I want to make, and this goes in your notes. Singing is a way that we teach and admonish others when we are assembled. We'll look at Colossians chapter 3, if you'll turn with me there. And in each of these next scriptures, I want to look very closely at the context because that is what's being challenged the most is they're saying, oh, the context is really not talking about worship services. So let's look very closely at the context here. Uh, the context in Colossians chapter 3, if you look at verse 9, it's talking about don't lie to each other. He's talking about verse 13, bear with one another, forgiving each other. It's all a, these, a lot of one another verses, which we've been studying about on Wednesday nights in uh, Dustin's Bible class. But verse 16, he says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever the context is here, he's talking about a time when we are teaching and admonishing one another. Now, when does that happen? Normally when we're assembled, that's when we're doing that, or maybe Bible class, or, or occasionally people would get together in the first century outside of Bible class, but... Keep in mind, they didn't have the, the way to, uh, to talk through cell phones or, or uh, texting or, or email or anything like that. Uh, they had to get together if they're going to teach and admonish one another. He says, we do this with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in our hearts to God. And so the implication here is some type of assembly where there's teaching and admonishing going on. And when they did that, uh, Paul says here to the church in Colossae, when we do that, we do it with singing. We do it with spiritual songs. Nothing mentioned here about the use of instruments. Let's look at number five. In the context of what Christians do when they are filled with the Holy Spirit, Paul says to sing. So Ephesians chapter 5. And just, again, context here, just look at verse 17 real quick. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. So that's what he's talking about. What is the Lord's will? Verse 18, and do not get drunk on wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So this is a verse where people say, well, you know, it's really not talking about worship. He's talking about drunkenness. He's talking earlier about sexual morality. Hey, do you know what uh, pagan worship was like in the first century? Uh, that's what it was. It was sexual morality. It was drinking. It was a lot of uh, wild stuff going on. And so uh, he's talking about a time when we are filled with the Spirit, verse 18. When again, verse 19, we're speaking to one another. And when do we do that? Well, it's when we are assembled together. Look at uh, verse 20. He says, Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even to the Father. So he's talking about a time when we are giving thanks to God. Now, be honest with me, during the week, when do you do that? I hope you do it all, all, every day. But primarily, when are we giving thanks to God? It's when we're assembled together and we're speaking to one another. And so you, you see this pattern in the scripture is they would speak to one another with their psalms and their hymns and the spiritual songs. And as I said, they were sitting across from each other and you just kind of get the picture that this is what first century Christians were like. They were speaking with songs, 
not with musical instruments. All right, let's look at uh, one more, and then I want to make some comments about all of these together. In the context of giving praise, the New Testament says we should sing in the name of the Lord, and your notes say Romans 15, verse 10. I apologize for that. It should be Romans 15, verse 9. I was off a verse. Look at Romans 15, verse 9. It says, And for the Gentiles to glorify God for His mercy as it is written. Therefore, I will give praise to you among the Gentiles, and I will sing to your name. And this is a quote from Psalms chapter 18, verse 49. The context again. The context is Paul is writing to the church in Rome, which had Jews in the church in Rome who were not accepting the Gentiles. They're saying, hey, you know, the Gentiles shouldn't be in here. And so Paul is writing the entire book of Romans to, to get the Jews to understand Gentiles need to be part of the church. And the word church is the word ecclesia, which means the assembly. It means those called out. It is the assembly. He says the Gentiles should be part of that. And when they are, what do we do? I will sing to your name. So here's the pattern that we see of the New Testament is this idea of singing when we're assembled. One more. James chapter 5. So let's look at this one. James chapter 5. And looking at verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. So, in the context of being cheerful, James says, what should you do? You should sing praises. All these things we see in the Bible. In, the, in these passages, and in the rest of the New Testament, instruments are never used in worship and praising for God. And some say, well, what about Revelation? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> Let's talk about Revelation. I love that book. In fact, they, these aren't in your notes, but let me walk you through the book of Revelation. This is just take a second. You, you won't mind. Just, just real quick here. Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. You can write these down in your notes. And chapter 4, verse 1. A voice is compared to the voice like a trumpet. It doesn't say it's a trumpet. It says it's a voice like a trumpet. Chapter 5, verse 8. The 24 elders are holding harps. Doesn't say they're playing them. In fact, they're also holding bowls of incense, so they probably weren't playing the harps. Chapter 8, verse 6 and following, trumpets are used to announce the, the plagues that are coming upon the, the Roman Empire. Chapter 14, verse 2, harps are used figuratively to describe a voice in heaven. Again, it's not a harp. It's saying that the voice sounds like a harp. In chapter 15 and verse 2, those who are victorious over the beast are holding harps. And again, it doesn't say that they are playing them. They're just holding them. And that's it. The whole book of Revelation. Yeah, instruments are mentioned. Are they ever used in worship to God? Not even in the book of Revelation. Not even in heaven. Now, I'm not saying that when we get to heaven, we won't play instruments. I don't know that. But there is no mention, even in the book of Revelation, that instruments are used to worship God. Those who wish to defend the instruments, and I, uh, I, I know and I've talked to several who, who hold that position, and uh, some of them are family members of mine whom I love dearly. I don't know if you have this discussion in your family or not, but uh, uh, we, we've talked about this, and I, I respect them, but he, those who, who use this, they say the Greek word solo means to sing in, with instruments, and the word psalmos means a uh, song sung with instrumental accompaniment. So let me talk a little bit about that in the time I have remaining. Does solo mean singing with instrumental accompaniment? This is the big question. Before we get into this, let me explain something. The meaning of words change. Did you know that? 
And so if we're going to determine whether a word means something, we kind of have to understand what time period we're talking about. I was studying uh, this past week about the Latin Vulgate Bible. Have you ever heard of the Latin Vulgate? The word Vulgate comes from the word vulgar. Seriously, vulgar. Vulgar means or meant back then to make common or to make public. And so they translated the Bible into Latin to make it vulgar. Get it? Vulgar doesn't mean that today, does it? If we say we want the Bible to be vulgar, we'd be, oh, well, that sounds a little strange to me. Even during our time, the meanings of words have changed. When I was a kid, the word gay meant happy. And that's all it meant. It never meant anything else. The, that word has changed. You, some of you remember when bad always meant the opposite of good? Do you remember that time? <laughs> Now we say, hey, that's bad. What does that mean? Well, it actually means it's good. It does? That word has changed. And then the, the most recent one, it, it, to me, is sick. Used to be, if you were sick, you went to the doctor, you went to the hospital. Now we say, oh, man, that's sick. What does that mean? That, that means it's good. Words are changing all the time. And so this word solo, this Greek word that we're going to study, I want to show you that the meaning of that word changed. Here's the premise I'm going to work from. Mizmor was the word for psalms in Hebrew. When the Jews translated the Bible from Hebrew to Greek, the language of Jesus' time, they translated the word mizmor as psalmos. That's called the Septuagint. Keep that in your brain. Septuagint was the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Psalmos came to mean singing without musical accompaniment. And solo, the Greek word, or the, the verb, is translated making melody in Ephesians 5.19. And I will sing in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 15. We read both of those just a moment ago. So that's the premise that we're going to be working from. Let's focus on one verse, Ephesians 5.19, because this is the one that uh, uh, most people bring up, and it has both of our words in it. Speaking to one another in psalmos, psalms, and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and solo, making melody with your heart to the Lord. So let's look at those. And this is uh, more material I got from the, the Nazarene Bible College. I went back and looked at their lexicons and their, uh, their Greek study tools. Uh, here's a, an old copy of the Henry Thayer uh, lexicon. And he starts off talking about solo and he explains under the Old Testament, yes, it meant to pluck, it meant to play, to use with instruments, singing with or without the use of musical instruments. But later on down the line here, uh, let me... Uh, See if I can read this. I don't know if you can see it, but he says the Septuagint for and much oftener for to sing to the music of the harp. So under the Old Testament, that's what it did. But it says in the New Testament to sing a hymn to celebrate praises of God. And it mentions James chapter 5 verse 13, which we just looked at a moment ago. Let me show you another one. This is the uh, uh, Frederick William Danker Greek English lexicon. He starts off the same way. He says, under the Old Testament, this is how it was used. It meant to, to sing with or without musical instruments. But in that area, let me see if I can focus, bring that in a little bit more. He says, uh, uh, this focus on singing continued until solo in modern Greek means singing exclusively. Get that? Exclusively. With no reference to musical accompaniment. Here's another one. Uh, this is the Molten translation. And uh, he says that the same thing, a solo and psalmos, both refer to singing with uh, musical instruments. But then he goes on to explain uh, here. He says uh, the word solo came to mean to sing, to sing praises to God. And it lists the five scriptures, actually, that we just looked at. Psalmos is a song of praise. So all of these are saying the same thing. Uh, this one is a commentary on the book of Psalms. It comes out of the Bible Knowledge Commentary, 1985, which I think Kathy and I got that about 1985. Uh, we still have that book in our library. 
But here's what Alan P. Ross says about it. The Greek word psalmos, which translates the Hebrew word mizmor, signifies music accompanied by stringed instruments under the influence of the Septuagint and of Christianity. The word psalmos came to designate a song of praise without an emphasis on accompaniment by stringed instruments. Now here's what's fascinating about that statement. Alan P. Ross is not a member of our fellowship. He's Baptist. And this book, this Bible Knowledge Commentary, was written by Dallas Theological Baptist Seminary. All he's doing, he's just reporting on his findings, and I appreciate his honesty. He's saying the word, the meaning of the word changed. Solo, under the Old Testament, yeah, it meant to, to sing and to be accompanied by musical instruments. But under the influence of the New Testament, it does not mean that at all. It means a cappella, what we call a cappella singing. All right, so number nine. Under the New Covenant, solo came to mean singing without instrumental accompaniment. That's what the word came to mean. Maybe I'm giving you too much Greek. You're starting to look at me with those blank stares uh, here. And I'm sorry if I'm being a little deep. So, okay, let's, let's toss all the Greek out. Let's just look at English, right? We have English translations of the Bible. This is what they're for, so let's go English. Number 10, every English translation translates psalms as psalms and solo as singing. I mean, you can look these up yourself. And I said every major, I should say every translation, because I haven't found one that's, a, that's a, an exception to this rule. Psalmos is always translated psalms, and solo, the word to sing, is always translated sing, or in Ephesians chapter 5, to make melody in your heart or with your heart. Here's the point. This is English translations where translators go back to the original Greek and translate it. If the word meant a company with music, why did they all translate it sing? Every single one of them said the word means to sing. No mention of musical instruments. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. Folks, just look at the verse. Is that really hard to understand? Seems pretty straightforward to me. That's what the command is. That word means sing a cappella, sing without the use of musical instruments. Number 11. Ephesians 5.19 says, when singing, we are speaking to one another. Here's the point. Instruments don't speak. And don't tell me Eric Clapton's a guitar can speak because he uses a voice synthesizer. Go back and watch the music video, okay? That one doesn't count. Instruments don't speak. Voices speak. People speak. Ephesians 5.19 says that when singing, we're making melody in our hearts to the Lord. You know, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 44, 34, excuse me, for the mouth speaks from that which fills the heart. The mouth speaks, not the instrument plays. The mouth speaks from that which fills the heart. When we sing, we're singing and we're making melody in our hearts to the Lord. So what is the conclusion of the matter? We sing a cappella. We sing a cappella in our worship services because that is what New Testament Christians do. But what about the Old Testament? Ah, Let's not open that can of worms until you come back at 6 o'clock tonight. And I promise you, we will talk about the use of musical instruments in the Old Testament. And I will try to, I've just kinda, I just kind of built a skeleton here this morning. We'll, we'll put a little more meat on the skeleton tonight. I hope you'll be back this evening. And again, if I don't answer your questions, uh, I, I love talking about this subject. I don't argue about it. If you want to argue, go somewhere else. But if you want to talk about this, I would be happy to sit down and talk with you about my journey. I can tell you that after I studied this out, my convictions grew so much stronger on this than what they, they used to be. The more I studied, the deeper my conviction grew that we got this one right, brothers and sisters. We got this one right. So, 
we're going to offer an invitation at this time. If you're out of Christ and you would like to become a Christian this morning, you would make our day. We love to see people coming to Christ. You can repent of your sins today. You can be baptized into Christ. If you're in Christ, but you're just needing prayers about something, I don't know where your heart's at this morning or what's going on. If there's something that's heavy on your heart and you want prayers, please come as we stand and sing.